Thank you, people, for joining uh, this session. I, I think the other session by Schrodinger is, is running a little over time, so uh, we go slow at the start, just waiting for people to trickle back into this room. Uh, but nonetheless, I'm absolutely delighted that uh, we managed to convince uh, Professor Berlinguet to join us. He's joining us from Canada. Uh, he has one of the best laboratories in the field, uh, in the world, and you know he does some groundbreaking work. And uh, today, you know, he's going to tell us more about ADA, a self-driving laboratory for discovering uh, energy materials. So you have 15 minutes. Um, two minutes before the end of your presentation, I will intervene uh, just to give you the heads up. Uh, apart from that, uh, you're ready to go. Great. Well, thanks for the invitation to be here. It's a fantastic lineup and I'm, I'm honored to be a part of it. Um, yes, we're, we're, we're working uh, with robots at the University of British Columbia and we like we like working with robots because you always get a captive audience with robots. Everybody loves robots. These kids love robots. And this is actually Ben McLeod standing here. He was the graduate student that really led this campaign for us building out Ada, which is um, a self-driving robot for thin film materials. Um, yeah, so when, when we consider, <clears throat> when we look at uh, robots today, um, you know, they, they become very sophisticated and we rely on them for, um, for, for manufacturing a, a range of things like, like Tesla's in this particular video. Um, but when we think about this and, and applying robots to the lab, it's, it's a bit challenging. Robots are, you know, these robots that you see in this video are, are very expensive. And so the economics of using them really only works when you're manufacturing millions of parts with that same robot. Um, the other thing that stands out to me in this video is that all these robots are protected by fences, or at least the humans are protected from the robots by, by fences. All right, so these robots are dangerous. And so that's something else that you don't really want to have in a, in a laboratory environment. And then the third thing is that all these robots really are doing just this, the same task over and over. And in the laboratory environment, you need to have a lot more dexterity. And so the, these robots just aren't necessarily a good fit for the laboratory environment. And what, really what drives my program at large is, is trying to find new clean energy materials and take those new energy materials to the market faster than ever before, all right? So this is this is really, we, we firmly believe that automation um, driven by algorithms is, 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 is really the key to um, really, really cleaning the, the atmosphere and the environment. Um, and so this is why we, we're, uh, we and others are, are looking at building out self-driving labs, having this, this combination of automation and machine learning to help us discover and optimize materials faster than ever before. But I would, I would make the claim that we're actually not very good at this part. I, th I think there's, there's lots of really good software solutions out there today, but on the automation side, it's really challenging to do this in a laboratory environment. And I, I really do think there is a, a home for automation in the laboratory. And, and you know, one of our projects was working on advanced solar cells. And I like, you know, I like to use this story of Val. So Val, um, as a fifth year uh, graduate student, she became a domain expert in the study of whole transport materials. And so even being a domain expert, being fully trained on this, well, she has an idea for a new material. She has to go and synthesize it. She characterizes it. And she does that really quickly because she's really good at what she does. But despite how, despite how good she is, she, she and like everybody else in this field spends months actually making hundreds, if not thousands of these solar cells with slightly different recipes, trying to find the, um, you know, a really high device efficiency. And it's that process that takes a long time to do. It's painful and it's, it's really not, it's not fun for the students. It's not fun for an advisor watching their students do this. And so this is really what motivated us to try to automate this process. And just to really explain to you why, why it takes so long, um, this is a cross-section of a perovskite solar cell. The perovskite is a light absorbing layer here. You've got your, your glass here. And so uh, we're just really interested in this whole transport layer that's responsible for shuttling charges from the perovskite to the contact. And anytime you come up with a new whole transport layer, you've got to, you've got to run through all these different conditions to figure out which one is going to be compatible with the actual device. And so you've got millions of different experiments that are available to you. And that's what, that's what really makes 